morning, good morning. Everybody alive and well today? Good to see you this morning. I turned on here. Is it me back there? You got it? Praise the Lord. I don't know if you heard the story about the guy that was just drunk as he could be and stumbling through the woods. Came out of the woods and by the river there was a baptismal service going on. Kind of went down, proceeded to walk into the water, bumped into the preacher. The preacher turned around, kind of shocked, mostly by the smell of alcohol. Asked the drunk, are you ready to find Jesus? The drunk answered, yes, I am. So he grabs him and dunks him in the water and pulls him up and says, brother, have you found Jesus? The drunk replied, no, I haven't found Jesus. So he dunks him under again, holds him under a little bit, pulls him back up. Brother, have you found Jesus? No, I haven't found Jesus. Third time, this time holds him under about 30 seconds, you know, baptizing him. Guy starts kicking a little bit and squatting. He pulls him up. Brother, have you found Jesus? To which the drunk replied, For oh, the love of God, is this, you sure this is where he went in it? <laughs> so, anyway, just seeing if you're awake this morning. <laughs> there is a better way to find Jesus, by the way. There is a better way to tell people about Jesus. We've talked several weeks about this issue of risk and daring to live the new life that is ours in Christ Jesus and just be shining like lights and be the salt of the earth that God has called us to be in the world. And as we've dealt with this topic, it really gets down to the old, good old word called being a witness for Christ. A lot of people don't even know where that word witness comes from. It's a really, it's an old Elizabethan term that was used by the word wit. Some of you that are older may understand that terminology. A lot of times we talk about someone having some wit, we think about personality. But it really means to give confession to something you know is a fact. Uh, you've heard the terminology dimwit, those kind of things. They all come from the idea that a wit is somebody who knows. Who, if you want to know what the truth is about an, it, it, an issue or situation, you need to ask the wit. And so we are the wit. We're the witness for Christ because it's not something we have to have yet to discover. It's something we have discovered. We know Christ. If Christ is in our life. We have everything to which to rejoice about, but even more that, everything which to share. Because what we have is whether the world realizes or not, and maybe even whether you realize or not, we have what the world needs. It may not even be looking for it, or maybe it is and just doesn't know that's what they're looking for. But we have the answer for the ills of the culture, the ills of society, and the ills that this world is facing. But it'll never be heard until we, we become the witness that God's called us to be, until we step out and be what God's called us to be in regard to our witness. I've been praying and asking the Lord several things in regard to these messages because I've, I've preached on sharing our faith a lot over the years, but I really, you know, sometimes we get dull of hearing. And I really wanted just to share something that would really impact our thinking. And as I thought about that and prayed about it more, I realized that that's exactly what needs to happen. We need to have something happen that impacts us in regard to the way we think and the way we're looking at the world around us and the way we see the issues of the world around us. So today I want to share with you a pretty simple message. It's about five ways in which we have to shift our thinking, make some adjustments to the way that we're living our lives and perceiving the world around us. So let's just start with this. Number one is pretty simple. We must shift our thinking from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. That has to do no longer with living our, our lives so turned inwardly. We're, we're the kind of the center of our own universe where the world revolves around us. We have to we have to push ourselves beyond those boundaries. And there's only one way to do that. You just can't wake up in the day and say, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that or I'm going to be a better person or a better Christian. It really takes the, the work and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And praise the Lord, what has been made available to every believer is the power and the boldness and every essential thing you need for living your life has been given to you in the form of a person. And that person is the Holy Spirit. He comes into the life of every believer. The Bible says, if any man is without Christ, he is none of his. So at the moment of our regeneration, at the moment of our salvation, the, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ comes to live in us by means of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's another thing we've talked about many times in regard to us yielding our lives to the Holy Spirit and surrendering our lives to the Holy Spirit. If we're going to have this, this dramatic shift in our thinking from 
this inward life of self-centeredness to this external life where our life is lived towards the Lord, it's going to be a work of the Holy Spirit within us. It's not something we just hit a switch. It means a, a, a point of really daily surrendering our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Apparently these things are not going to work properly today as a result of that one. But Acts 1.8 says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, folks, the Holy Spirit, obviously, that was the message of, uh, of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit would come and would inhabit the lives of anybody who would come to Jesus Christ. That is the message of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming. But we also see as we study the New Testament, there's another, there's another situation involved here in regards to the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to have him resident in our life. It's another thing for him to be residing and ruling and presiding over our life. Where each day my life is surrendered to God so that the Holy Spirit is filling me, equipping me, strengthening me, encouraging me. So my day must begin with this important part of surrendering my heart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and surrendering my will to the control of the Holy Spirit. Now this is a volitional, I mean, this, you have to do this. It just doesn't come by waking up in the morning, I'm a Christian, great, let's get about my day. There's this point of involving yourself in this process. It's like getting in your car and pulling it down into drive. An action has to be taken whereby you surrender. And I think the best thing anybody can do as a Christian is that before their feet even hit the ground, you put your feet on the edge of the bed and say, when I put my feet on the ground today, Jesus, they're putting on the ground for you. I am making a concerted, committed, disciplined effort at this point in time to, to receive the empowering of your Holy Spirit for my life today. I confess Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life today. And as we do that, God, whether we feel anything or not, God begins to move in our heart and life so that we're being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we begin to, begin to notice at this point, we do begin to have a shift in our thinking. Our attitudes begin to change. We begin to be a little bit more than what we were in becoming aware. Listen, if we don't do this, if, if, if our heart is not turned to the Lord, we're going to miss it completely because He is the source of our, well, let's put it to our saltiness. When we talk about being the salt of the earth, He's the source of the saltiness, all right? He's the source of the strength. He's the source of the, of the vigor. He's the source of, 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 the, of the message. It's all wrapped up in him. And as I look to him, I do believe he will change my heart, my heart, my life, my mind. But there has to be a focused commitment on my part to yield to him this day. If that's not a part of your daily routine, you need to change the way you think. And what will happen in changing the way you think in this regard will, will be this whole shift will begin to take place. Now, I just, just piled up and we'll go back to it in 2 Timothy. When the Bible tells us God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but of power and love and a sound mind or discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. How many of you are familiar with that verse? Just raise your hand. Almost every one of us in here. But let me ask you if, you if you're really familiar with it in the context that it's given. A lot of people have quoted this verse to me when they're talking about having to make difficult choices in their life. Are they facing some fear in a decision that they're making? And, you know, and they, well, I know God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, you know. But in the context of what this is all about, it's really all about standing up and confessing Jesus Christ. It's all about sharing, as he says here, the testimony of our Lord. And he's saying to those of you who are willing to do this, and you don't have to be afraid. God has given you a spirit of power. God's given you love. God's given you self-control and discipline, the things that you're going to need to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's nice to realize that obviously a principle, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but in the context of this passage, it's talking about me living for Jesus openly and publicly and unashamedly living the life that God's called me to live. I don't have a spirit of fear. God's given me a spirit of love. And obviously one more thing about this passage is the heart and the burden and the passion that God gives a Christian to tell other people about Jesus it's not normal and natural to our flesh, all right? God will give us the spirit of love because mostly we are self-centered. Mostly our thinking is self-centered. 
But when we yield to the spirit of grace, the spirit of God, God begins to transform our heart. He begins to transform our mind and our eyes are open. And we begin to become compassionate for people without God. It's, it's so interesting to me that when we do get saved, we, we all of a sudden we realize I'm a pretty despicable sinner. You know, I need to be saved. I need to give my life to Jesus. But we, we, we just, it, it stops there. So often it just stops there and we don't realize that, hey, there's a world full of despicable sinners that need Jesus. Now, we, we get as far as that first part. We see there's a world full of despicable sinners and we're ready to judge them all to hell. You know, those despicable sinners. Look at me. I'm not a despicable sinner anymore. Those despicable sinners, you know, so, those sorry things. Hey, no, we need to realize that when we realized our despicable sinfulness and our unrighteousness, we also realized the grace, the love, and the glory of Jesus Christ and reached out in faith and received him into our lives. Now we need to see the rest of the world needing that same transformation. Our thinking shifts. It begins to, and if it doesn't change, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be effective. And we're not gonna be a soul winner for Christ. The second thing I wanna mention is we must shift our thinking from temporal values to eternal values. All too often, we're only thinking about now, the present, or maybe just a little bit into the future, but it's not in regard to eternal things. And it really, this has to do with a whole set of values in and of themselves that we realize, you know, that we are part of a greater kingdom, the kingdom of God, that we really are the ambassadors for Christ. Those things that we've mentioned in the last couple of weeks, that's who I am, that, that's what I am. And I began to value that more than I, I'm concerned about the value of, of the world situation. Luke 9 says this, anyone who lets himself be distracted from the work that I plan for him is not fit for the kingdom, all right? They're just not fit for the kingdom. Now, that's, a, that's an amazing thing if you start thinking about that. Right? I mean, hold on. I mean, I, I want to be fit for the kingdom. But if I am more concerned about my plans instead of God's plans, then I'm not really, I'm not really fit. 2 Timothy 2, 4 says, No soldier in active service will entangle himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who has enlisted him as a soldier. What's he saying here? You need to get your value system set up straight. First priority of our life are the eternal things. Secondary are the temporal things. We have to deal with the temporal things. We have to make a living. We provide for our families. We have to go to school. We have to do all these things, but that's a real part of my life. But the foundation of my life is not those things. The foundation of my life, our eternal foundation, is the Lord in my life. And so if I'm gonna be effective in my life, I gotta realize these eternal issues come first and the priority of my life. And only in making them the priority will these temporal issues line up correctly. I really firmly am committed to the idea that most people live such closed in lives, focused on themselves, their, their temporal world, their little situation. They're never really concerned about that which is without them. And they're miserable people. They're not happy. Their marriages aren't happy. Their marriages aren't healthy. Their families aren't strong. And, and much of it gets back... Uh, to the situation of being so turned in. And they don't resolve the situation by turning out and up and looking to the Lord and seeing their place in God's kingdom. They just start looking for more answers to their self problems. They go buy more books, get more tapes, get more TV shows and to tell them what they need to do for their little world. When in reality, we need to shed the skin of self-absorption and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and realize, hey, I'm a light. I'm here to make a difference. It's not about me today. The world's not all about me. The world's about others. And guess what happens? As I make it about the Lord and about others and about his will, God begins to do something in my world. He begins to heal my situation. He begins to take care of my need. In Matthew 6, is the passage most of you are familiar with, that says, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. That's in the context of, of what we're talking about. Don't be so absorbed with all the stuff that you forget the most important thing of all. That's the kingdom of God, the work of God, the will of God in your life. Where does that fit into your life? Where does God's kingdom, his plan, his purposes, where does that fit into your schedule? If it doesn't, then you're gonna to have to shift your thinking from these, these temporal values to eternal values and from these fleeting things to eternal things. There's the, uh, this verse in the, in the NCV says this, you can flip it up there for me. It says, the thing you should want most is God's kingdom and doing what God wants. Then all these other things you need will be given to you. The messenger translation puts it this way. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provision, 
Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. That's, that's a powerful word for us today because what most people are absorbed with is having their personal need met. But it's pretty clear here in Scripture that if we can shift our thinking to, to the Lord God and to His will and to His kingdom, He's going to take care of all these things for us. They will, they will take care of themselves. We are citizens of this other kingdom anyway and which we represent. The third shift that needs to come, an adjustment needs to be made, is, is our thinking from just, it has to do with our goals. Not just the whole value system, but our goals, from fleeting goals to eternal goals. You say, what do you mean? I'm, I'm a goal person. I like setting goals. Personal goal setting is a good thing. And they think it's important to have some goals in your life. But don't forget the most important goals are not the fleeting things, are not just the temporal things, things that will be, be gone, all right? They'll be gone one day. It won't be of any importance. You need to set yourself some spiritual goals that you are set on meeting and keeping and sticking to no matter what. And these are simple things to start with, obviously. Spending time with God. I, I'm going to be committed to having a time in my day where I'm going to spend some time with the Lord. That's a righteous and a good goal. In fact, that's a goal that will affect the rest of your life in so many different ways. We don't have time to begin to get into it. A righteous goal. I need to have a spiritual goal of saying, you know, today. Here's a good goal for each one of us. Today. Each day this week, I'm going to at least, at least one person I'm going to share Christ with. At least one. More than just come to church or invite them. I'm going to seek to start a conversation that I can share the gospel with. That's a good goal, isn't it? That's a righteous goal. But more so, let's broaden it a little bit more. I have a goal. Nobody who names the names arms is going to die and go to hell. <laughs> Not going to be any arms is in hell. Isn't that a good goal? <laughs> Any Johnsons, any Smiths, any Dvorak's, no Duttons, not going to be in hell. Because I'm going to do everything God allows me to do and can do to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not going to happen. They're going to call my family role in heaven, and it's going to be here, 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 here. <laughs> because I'm going to do my part in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a pretty good goal, is it not? I'm going to make it my goal. And we could, again, this is an endless list of things, but somewhere we have to realize that heaven and hell, they are realities. They're eternal values that we cannot get away from. You may seek to in this lifetime, but you're going to die and you're going to face that judgment of God. It's going to be heaven or it's going to be hell. You either chose Christ or you rejected Christ. If you receive Christ, give your heart to Christ, it's heaven. If you rejected Christ, then it's hell. Now, I, I, I agree with that, don't you? But that doesn't just apply to me. That applies to every person who's ever been born. Everybody dies and either goes to heaven or they go to hell. And they only get to heaven one way. So I've got to somehow realize the, the truth of that and embrace an eternal system of values, an eternal mindset that realizes, hey, you know, I need, I need to get more focused on telling people about Christ. I mean, we blog, we text, we tweet, we, we Facebook, we, we, we call. We do everything imaginable about every topic in the world. I mean, some of you post pictures of your dog, your cat, videos of your food. Right? Let, let, let's salt up the conversation some. Let's start texting some more about Jesus. Let's start blogging some more about Christ. Let's start tweeting Jesus. Let's start Facebooking more about the Lord. Let's add some salt. I, I, you know, I'm not a Facebooker. But when I need a subject to preach on, I'll read Kathy's Facebook. <laughs> I've never seen so much junk in all my life. And people just air out dirty laundry. You know, say stuff about other people. I mean, on and on it goes. It's just, it's an endless topic conversation situation. But what we have to realize is really, this whole situation, it's going by like this. It's all going to end with God. The Bible says all things are from Him. All things are to Him. All things are through Him. It's all, it started with Jesus. It started with God. When God said, in the beginning, it's going to end. When God says, in the ending, it's a new beginning. Everything going on around us, we have to start looking at with a different eye. 
When you watch the news, what, what's going on in your mind when you see what's happening in the world today? I mean, we, we talk about how difficult it is, how critical it is, how horrible it is. Man, we need to do this. Obama needs to do that. The Democrats need to do this. The Republicans need to do this. And on and on the list goes. But how many of us really have watched the world news from an eternal perspective? Hey, it's all coming according to plan. I hate to let you know that. All right? It's all happening. What's going on in Iran coming in to help Iraq? Well, who'd ever thought that happened? Amen. Here's the Iranians coming in to be good friends with Iraq. That's not about Iran. It's not about Iraq. It's all about the Shia Muslim fighting against the Sunni Muslim. And that, that war has been raging for centuries and centuries, and it's going to come in the near future to a head. And one side's going to purge out the other side, or at least attempt to. And then all those post-communist countries, all those I call them the Junkistans, Kazakhstan and Ayakistan and all the other Akistans, you know, they were all Muslim countries to start with. All those countries are going to get together with that great Russian bear. It's all coming together. There's going to come a move against the nation of Israel like the world has never seen before, seeing close facsimiles and types of it, but not to this degree that's going to happen. It's all coming down. The, the issue in America with racism, black, white, Hispanic, Latino, all these different things, the Bible, Jesus said, listen, in the end times will be like this, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. You say, isn't that just repeating a nation, nation, kingdom? No, no. One literally means a nation against the nation, the other has to do with race against race. It's just the way it's going to be in the end times. The hatred, the selfishness, the self-centeredness of man, it's what it's all about that's going on. It's culminating. But what an opportunity. You know, we have that little byline out there that says, for such a time as this, you could have been born, sovereign God could have placed you on the planet at any time and any country, anywhere he wanted to. But sovereign God planted you in this generation at this time for a reason. And the reason is we have to open our eternal eyes and say, hey, hey, this thing is coming to a fast end. We need to get on fire for Jesus. We need to be what God's called us to be now more than any other time in our life. We need to have a radical shift in our thinking from these temporal values to eternal values, from fleeting temporal things to eternal goals. We need to get Christ-minded, Christ-oriented, and see what's happening. L listen to this verse in Acts, Acts 17, 26. For one man, God, created all the nations throughout the whole earth. God decided beforehand which should rise and fall. God determined their boundaries. His purpose in all of this was that the nations should seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. What's he saying here? He says, God is in control of all things. And God's a sovereign God. Jeremiah says, God tells us that the nations are as a drop in the bucket, all right? At what time he wants to raise one up, he'll raise it up. At one time he wants to put one down, he can put it down. He's sovereign God. So I don't need to be so stressed out about the nations coming against nations and kingdom against kingdom. What I need to be focused upon is I'm here in this darkest of dark worlds, probably darker than it's ever been, to shine as a light. Now, the beauty of that is that the darker the night is, the brighter one light shines. Amen. Amen. The darker the night, the more your light will shine. But if the light is not lit, in other words, Christ is not in you, and the fuel is not the lamp, the Holy Spirit's not filling you, then you're not going to shine at all. So you have to make some adjustments to realize, hey, I have been failing to see what God's doing in the world. I've been sitting around shaking my head at the terrible situation instead of realizing, here's my opportunity. Here's the opportunity for our church. Here's the opportunity for my life. Here's the opportunity for my family to be what God's called us to be. The fourth thing is we have to shift our thinking from security to service. The Bible says in Mark 8, for whoever will save his life, well, if you go back and fix that for him, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Let me read this to him from, and I'm, you know, I'm not a big living Bible and contemporary version, but let me share some of these translations. It says in Mark 8, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Living Bible says, only those who throw away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it really means to live. I mean, for a paraphrase, that's not too bad, is it? If you're not willing to throw your life out there on the line for Jesus, you're not fit for the kingdom, as we said a while ago. If you're not willing to count it all but lost for Christ, you're going to lose your life. 
You're trying so hard to save it. You're trying so hard to put yourself together. Make something of yourself. Be somebody. Be the number one. Get ahead of the crowd. For what? If it's not for Jesus and if it's not for the gospel, then you really have gained nothing. You know, what breaks my heart is as I do watch the news and I see so many people who are suffering for the cause of Christ. It's staggering to see what's going on in our world. And at the same time, you move it over here towards the further western hemisphere and you see the Christian world living in such comfort amidst such chaos. How, how, can, how can this be? I mean, how, are, we, are we not seeing what's happening around us? Do we not know that we have brothers and sisters in Christ all over the globe who are paying a dear price for standing up and confessing Jesus is Lord and they're still doing it? They're not denying him? They're not, they're not turning from him? They're not repenting of their faith? They're still embracing Christ and the gospel? I mean, it's Christians of all, it's not just Coptic Christians, there's evangelical, there's all kinds of Christians out in the world who love Christ, who love God, who little children have given their hearts to the Lord as well. They won't even deny Christ. But we have so many well-to-do, comfortable Christians in the Western Hemisphere who are so look so good and sharp and nice and neat, nice and neat, trying to impress the world around them, who wouldn't dare say a word about Jesus lest they might offend somebody. Where, what have we come to? Don't we really see what's going on? The gospel, the kingdom message, it began in a bloodbath. Obviously the Lord's to start with, but then you follow the mortars of the first and second century and then down through the ages. I was reading an article by, by Michael McClemon and he wrote in the Journal of American Academy of Religion. He wrote this back in December 2002. He said, the total number of Christian martyrs during the 20th century is reported to be at 45 million. And we just concluded that century. We're not talking about, we're talking about most of our lifetime. 45 million Christians lost their life for the cause of Christ. Does that, does that, you know, a lot of times we're willing to talk about the Jewish Holocaust of 6 million Jews. But during that time, I think Brother Stonel, they killed 10 million Christians. Those guys themselves. Millions upon millions. There's 100 million Christians today, they say, under persecution in 60 countries. 100 million right today are facing persecution. If you'll click through that list, it says each month, 322 Christians are killed for their faith. That's this month. 322 believers will lose their life instead of renounce their faith. 214 churches or properties owned by Christians will be destroyed. 772 believers will become victims of violence, beatings, rape, abductions, arrest, or forced marriages. And then, by the way, these, these statistics, these are not as fresh as they ought to be. They don't even take into account what ISIS has done. Don't get ahead of me. <laughs> they don't even take into account what ISIS has done in the beheading that we're seeing take place now on a daily basis and the crucifixion of believers. What they'll do a lot of times, they'll, they'll pull the Christian families out together and they'll tell the parents that if they don't renounce their, their, their faith, they're going to kill their children. They kill their children either way whether they do it or not. Or they'll kill the parents and leave the children. Then they'll sell the children into servanthood and slavery. Well, I don't know them. I want you to know they're part of your family if they're believers. Amen. They're brothers and sisters in Christ if they're believers. You know, that's why I, I praise the Lord for the work that's going on in different countries in regard to this particular thing. I have friends that we minister to and have been a very big part of their spiritual life in Bulgaria. I mean, those pastors we ministered to in Bulgaria are now going in to those Muslim countries reaching people for Jesus Christ. And they're having great success among the Muslims. These are Bulgarian pastors. These are the guys that were persecuted for, for years and years by the communists. And now, in their freedom, they're not going back trying to find a softer couch to lie on, a bigger car to drive. They're, go they're going out with the gospel. And they're preaching the truth to these others. And they're receiving Christ. And many of them are coming to, you'd be surprised what's happening in the Muslim world today. Thousands upon thousands of them are coming to Jesus Christ, even in the midst of the persecution. And we should be praying for these people. We should be praying daily for these, for these people. We should be praying God give them courage. Don't let them be disheartened. Be strong in the face of death. Give them peace. Grant them safety. Our prayers ought to be sounding daily for those who face such loss. I think I've shared this with you before. One of my first trips to Bulgaria and meeting these persecuted pastors. And remember, guys I'm talking to in, in this, these first trips there, these are guys who've just been let out of prison. 
Some were killed before they ever got out of prison. They weren't going to let them go. These are guys that they would let out maybe for six months at a time, and then they'd go arrest them again and send them up to Siberia during the winter months. Or just come in, they found out they were having a meeting, come in and, and drag everybody out and beat them up and then beat the pastor. Sometimes they'd rape their wives, beat their children in front of them. I, I sat down and said, man, I'm just, you know, I'm humbled by the opportunity to be here and, and spend time with you. One of them wisely said to me one time, they said, you know, I've, I've thought often that would it be harder to be a Christian here or in the West where you are? He said the temptation to renounce Christ comes in all different kinds of ways, doesn't it? He said sometimes it's the lullaby of worldliness and comfort and security. It keeps so many Christians from standing up for their faith in Jesus Christ. But let me put it on the bottom line, this is it. To deny Christ is to deny Christ. And would we do it for the sake of popularity or friendship or advancement or gain? I would hope not. We have to shift our thinking from security to realizing that we are servants of Christ and we're here for the glory of God and we're here for the kingdom of Christ, not for ourselves. The last is this. We have to shift our thinking from comfort to sacrifice. Romans 12 is that passage we're all familiar with. I beseech you by the mercies of God, present yourselves a living sacrifice. The new contemporary version says, since God has shown us great mercies, offer your lives as a living sacrifice to him. Romans 6 says, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Present yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. One translation put it this way, give yourselves completely to God, every part of yourself. You want to be tools in the hands of God to be used for God's good purpose. If we don't shift our thinking from the attitude of comfort and ease to realizing, hey, we are to be a living sacrifice. We're not going to accomplish anything for the Lord in our personal lives, in our church, or any other part of our life. That we really are here for the glory of God. And we really are intended to be used by God. And the best investment of my time, the best investment of my talents, the best investment of my treasures is for the kingdom of God. Does it mean I ignore everything else? No, he's saying everything will be taken care of. You'll have the direction, you'll have the, the strength, you'll have the wisdom, you'll have the grace. It's all going to be provided for you when you get the priorities in the proper order. But if I cannot come to the place to realize that I am a servant of Christ and I am a priest unto the Lord, then it's not going to go any further. If all I see myself is I'm just a Christian and I go to church and I, I may give some money and I attend the local services, if that's all Christianity is for you, all you've got is religion. You've got some X's that have to be done and some I's to be dotted and some T's to be crossed and you kind of feel comfortable at the end of all that. It's legalism. It's religion. But if any man's in Christ, which was our anthem last week in our verse, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old stuff's gone. We have a new life. And now we're going to live this new life. We can't miss this opportunity. There was a tragic event back in 1964 in New York and Queens that took place and it held the media's attention for quite some time. And I've read about this instance over the years several times, seeing illustrations back to it. But it was approximately about 3.20 in the morning in Queens, midtown New York. And there was a young lady by the name of Kitty Genovese. She was 28 years old. March 13, 1964. She's worked a late shift. She's going home. And she gets out of her, parks her car near her apartment She's about 35 yards away from the front door of her apartment building. And as she gets out of her car, she gets about as far as the street lamp to cross the street. And a man approaches her and grabs her and stabs her. This time she screams. Somebody help me. My God, he stabbed me. Help me. Nearby apartments, 10th story building, lights start clicking off and on the building. Someone throws up the window and says, hey, leave that lady alone. The attacker looked up, shrugged, went down the street. Miss Genevieve struggled to get to her feet. The lights went back out in the apartment. When the lights went out in the apartment, the attacker came back and he stabs her again. And she starts screaming, I'm dying. He stabbed me again. I'm dying. And again, the lights come on the building. A few windows open, nearby apartments. And again, the assailant leaves. Gets into his car 
and he drives away. Miss Genevieve staggers to her feet. City bus drives by about 3.55. The lights go out in the building. The attacker decides to come back, I guess, to make sure she's dead and can't testify against him, whatever. He comes back the third time. He finds her in the doorway of her apartment. She didn't even get in the door. And he stabs her multiple times again. Now, this time it was fatal. It's 3.50 when the police received their first call. They respond quickly. Within two minutes, the records show they were at the scene. But she was already dead. It went on to be reported across the country that Kitty Genovese was a name that became symbolic of uh, the public mind, the dark side of American culture and the national character. People that had turned so inward, only concerned about their own lives. Her name would stand for the people who became indifferent, the people who were too frightened or too alienated or too self-absorbed, who just didn't want to get involved to help somebody that was in trouble. I don't think much has changed in America since those days. We haven't seen a lot of change in the national character. But I talk about opening our eyes and seeing the eternal value of things versus the temporal things. If we were to open our eyes today lift up our windows and listen to the voices of so many around us that are around us every day, every place we go, who are hurting, who are struggling, whose marriages are falling apart, whose families are in crisis, whose children are in harm, whose situations are extremely difficult, who some are contemplating suicide, ending their own lives. It's everywhere we go, but we don't sense it, we don't see it, we don't hear it because we become too self-absorbed and too self-involved. It's somebody else's problem. There's a great threat culturally, but even more so, there's a greater threat spiritually. And people are suffering. And it was Professor Howard Hendricks who said, you know, in the midst of a generation that is screaming for answers, Christians are stuttering at best. All around us. What are we going to do with our lives? Even better yet, what are we going to do the rest of our lives? You've heard the old saying, today's the first day of the rest of your life. What are you going to do with it? There's this passage that rings so clear. and I, Maybe you've never even seen it, you've read over it before, but you've never seen it. It is so profound in the book of Acts when it says, For David, after he had served the purposes of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers. Look at that again. David, after he'd served the purposes of God in his own generation. That's the one we're responsible for, our own generation. What an epitaph. What, what words to be written over a tombstone, amen? He served the purposes of God in his generation. That was, that was the heart of the Apostle Paul in Acts when, he, when he, we first started seeing pinning out some of these words about the goals of his life. When he said, I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He said, oh, it's important to me that I just talk about Jesus. That's it. Keep professing Christ. Keep sharing Jesus. Every day, people risk stepping out of their house because they're known to be a Christian in certain parts of our world. It's time for us to dare to rise to the same kind of thing. Say, so listen, it needs to be known I'm a believer. And it needs to be known I'm a believer so that people can know where to find their answers. It's important for me to give them the answers as a believer. I want to make my life count for Christ. That's when life has real value. That's when life has real substance. If we don't get to that part, we miss it completely. I remember hearing an old preacher, I think it was R.G. Lear, one of those guys on the radio, said, will anyone be in heaven on account of you? Well, my thought first, well, nobody's going to be in heaven on account of me. They're there because of Jesus. And that's understood. Let's not ignore the real truth of, that, of the question. Paul said, you know, my crown of rejoicing when I get to him is going to be you. I'm going to see you there. That should be our heart. But the people I come in contact with, I'm the avenue to the answers. I'm the doorway to the truth. I'm the introduction to life. Be that person. Be that individual. Would you stand with your heads bowed?